Okay, so we'll start our tour um, of multi-level modeling, or at least key aspect of multi-level modeling. What's this about? Well, relative to what we've been doing for the most part in our course, like regression analyses, multi-level models extend those models often in ways that are suitable for accounting for associations or dependencies among units of analysis that may be uh, organized in some way or grouped or sometimes clustered in some way. In, in my world, the classic example of this when we study things like students taking uh, uh, courses in education and then having scores on things like tests, well, if students take multiple tests, we have test scores nested within students. Every student has their own score. And students are nested or grouped within classrooms. They have their own classroom structure. Those classrooms are grouped or nested or clustered by schools. Schools might then be grouped by things like geography. Schools exist, at least traditionally, in a geographic location, which may have other organizations like school district or county in the United States or state or nation or uh, continent, if you want. There are different levels of grouping or organization that we might consider. There are a variety of names that these kinds of models go by. I tend to like multi-level. They're sometimes called hierarchical, which sometimes conveys information, sometimes can be misleading. They're also referred to as mixed effects and random effects models. I'm going to stay away from that terminology as much as I can. Uh, you'll see it, but I, those terms are used for so many other things that it's often ambiguous when we say, oh, this is a mixed effects model. What do we really mean by that? Regardless of the name, these models tend to involve regression-like stuff, regression-like models as their pieces or components that are assembled or formulated at different levels, different ways. Like regression models, we're going to see structures where we have something uh, modeled as a function of various things, like predictor variables. Uh, here's an example that I use. It comes from our textbook, Cohen, Cohen, Weston, Aiken, uh, on studying weight loss. And so they say, suppose we are considering and studying weight loss as predicted by one's an individual's motivation to lose weight. We have data from groups that have a focus on diet and weight control. Um, so people meet as a group in some sort of structure. These groups meet regularly and have some cohesion. That is, there's something about that group that they experience. They're not randomly put with different members of different groups. They kind of go through time as a group. Uh, we have some reason to suspect, or we want to consider the possibility, that group membership makes a difference. Some groups might have different values of things like motivation to change their weight or their diet, things like that. The idea is that there's some association, some correlation among members of each group. So in this data set, there are 386 individuals or subjects in total, but they are grouped into 40 groups. Again, the metaphor here that I often refer back to is in my work in education. I've got a whole bunch of kids taking tests, but they're grouped by classroom. They got something in common being in that classroom, that teacher is different than the other teacher down the hall, is different than the other teacher in a different school building. There's something to do with a common experience or activity that makes that group meaningful. Does that make sense? So we're going to start building our multi-level model by thinking about simple situations with single level analyses. We're going to build up the structures. So here's our situation. Let's forget about prediction right now. Let's just think about the outcome variable, single variable here. The mean number of pounds lost in this weight loss data set. So each person has a certain number of uh, how much weight and number of pounds that they lost. And we can think about that the average for everybody or a group specific average. Here's our model of the outcome. And I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on the notation 
because it helps communicate some things and there'll be some distinctions later. My outcome variable is y, and the subscript i indexes a unit or a subject, a participant, in this case, a person. And the story of y is that it's going to be modeled as having a normal distribution with some mean mu and some variance sigma squared. This is regular old stats 101. I got scores on a variable, and my story is um, my scores over these people follow a normal distribution. Here it is for the data. There's a little histogram uh, imposing a normal distribution. Looks reasonable to me. I can give you some summary statistics. Across the, what is it, 386 people, the sample mean is 15, sample standard deviation, four and a half or so. Okay, so let's start thinking about this as a model for the outcome variable y. Our story is that Scores are normally distributed with some mean and variance. I, I, I just calculated the estimates based on the sample data. Estimated mean of 15, variance is, well, the standard deviation squared, 4.53. If I were to talk about any particular individual based on this analysis, what would I expect or what would my prediction be for the number of pounds lost for this person? I'd predict the mean. Knowing nothing else, the mean is a good measure of central tendency, uh, minimizes uh, sums of squared errors. So I'd say, all right, for any individual, my best guess is the mean. In this case, it's estimated to be 15. How about a group? If I said, well, there's 40 of these groups out there, and I haven't analyzed them separately by groups, but if I had a group of some, some of these individuals, what would I expect the average in the group would be? I'd also use the mean. It's a summary of central tendency. I'd say if you're going to give me a grouping of these people, I think the average represents a good story for the grouping. So far, so good? No regression here. No predictors. It's just thinking about a single variable. We can, however, conceive of this as a regression analysis. Here's my model. This is what we just looked at, an outcome variable y all by itself. And my story for y is that it has a distribution, mean and variance. All right, I'm just going to change the notation a little bit. Here's my story for y. It has a distribution where the mean parameter I'm going to call b0. That's our regression intercept. And the variance of y I'm going to call sigma square e for error variance. I just changed the notation. But this is indeed the results you get from a regression analysis that has an intercept, B0, but no predictors. So usually in regression, we write our story as, OK, y equals intercept plus slope times predictor plus error. Errors have some distribution. Okay, I, if I drop the error, then I get the y prime, the predicted value, that's the expected value for the outcome variable. What's written up top there is a very equation way of writing regression, y equals. That is equivalent to this more distributional way of writing regression. This says there's a distribution for y. That distribution is a normal distribution with some mean given by the regression structure, and some error variance. If you're like me, this is how you first and most often encounter regression, y equals or y prime equals. But it's equivalent to this distributional expression. Well, now we can see it as a regression. If we cover up the slope times predictor, this is exactly what we had a moment ago. This is an intercept-only regression model that gives the mean and variance for the outcome variance. Recall our assumptions of regression models. The errors have a mean of zero, have constant variance, and follow a normal distribution. Under those assumptions, the dependent or outcome variable is modeled as conditionally normally distributed. 
That is, you can write it in this equation -y way. It is functionally equivalent to this distribution way. And we've seen this picture before. This is a picture of regression where we are emphasizing the story of regression is that the y values have a distribution. They vary. Even when you tell me x, there's still variability in the y's. They have a distribution. What kind of distribution? If you tilt your head, it should look like a normal distribution. What is the mean of each of these little normal distributions? Well, you tell me the x, I'll multiply it by the slope, add the intercept, and that gives me the mean. It's right at the line. And what's the variability of these little distributions? What's the spread? That's our old friend, the error variance. This is a distributional way of expressing regression. Okay, so what does intercept-only regression modeling look like? Well, there's regular regression. y equals intercept plus slope times predictor plus error. Uh, oh yeah, I can express that distributionally. Intercept-only means you have no predictors. What's left? y equals intercept plus error. Same assumptions about errors. So what's the expected value? Just the intercept written as a distribution. Wait a minute. Um, before we looked at this as a regression structure, I just looked at it as one variable y all by itself and said, I can estimate the mean, I can estimate the variability. Well, sure enough, the estimated mean in this model is going to be exactly equal to the intercept. That's what the intercept will be. Because it plays the role of the mean in this distribution. And the error variance, that's just going to be the variance of the y value. We come down to saying the distribution for y is a normal distribution with mean given by intercept plus slope times predictor. It's just the intercept right now, 15, and variance given by the error variance. This is exactly what we said, I don't know, five minutes ago, before we looked at it as regression, and we just said it's a variable y all by itself. Let's go through the same steps. What would we think about for any particular person, for any subject, what would the expected value be? Well, I don't have their values of x to put in because I don't have any x's in the model. What's the expected value for any person? 15. How about for any group of people? 15. Yeah, we get the same answers. So when you learned about doing an analysis, like here's a variable, estimate the mean and variance, you didn't learn about it as a regression, but you could think of it as an intercept only regression analysis. The intercept is the mean, the error variance is the variance of the outcome variable. wait a minute, if we have groups of people, shouldn't we look at the data within that person's group to come up with an estimate of them? If we think that groups matter, what group you might belong to matter, shouldn't we focus on the group when coming up with uh, predictions or estimation for somebody? 